Hi, everyone. Let's welcome Luca to give a talk on porting a massive parallel multi GPU application to Julia. So let's welcome. So good. good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yeah, looks like the mic works. Um, yeah, so, sorry, it looks like the projector kind of transforms a bit the image. I hope the slide will be fine and that it will be readable. So, yeah, um, I'll talk about some uh, high performance computing using Julia. This is kind of some work that we initiated with my colleagues uh, very recently and it's still somehow ongoing. But, yeah, like I heard a lot today, whatever feedback and suggestion. Uh, you may have, feel free to contact us. And also, if you want to use what I'm going to present, just write us back. I will have to rush for the plane right after my presentation, so uh, feel free to write by email because I think we'll not have chance to meet in person afterwards. So I'm a um, geophysicist, computational geophysicist, and basically I'm interested to understand how uh, rapid how fluid may uh, rapidly migrate in subsurface reservoir and dynamically create new pathways. And this is, for example, relevant when you do uh, carbon sequestration storage, like you have fluids, you compress them, you pump them into the underground, and you want them to stay there forever or like for as long as possible. And then you monitor and you see that actually uh, all kind of crazy things are going on. And then you need, like, you want to have a physical insight what's going on down there. So those problems are uh, usually kind of uh, tricky because uh, we kind of, their observation, but their lack of predictive models. Um, they're like kind of spontaneous processes that happen. It's kind of mesoscale or macro scale domains, but the action is very localized. It's very spontaneous and one need to capture it both in space and time. There is one, it's not pre-prescribed, so one does not exactly know where these uh, processors, couple processes uh, will happen. And, um, uh, the, the, the way it's described is basically solving PDEs, um, uh, fluid dynamics or uh, mechanical um, models. And those PDEs, they're coupled, they're nonlinear. They include um, tensor field, vector fields, some scalars. So it's kind of a lot of work to do and it's in 3D. So it gets computationally quite challenging. And on top of that, in order to get an accurate result, we need somehow target quite high resolution. And um, yeah, and those are forward models. So how does kind of some simulation look like? It's, I will show you here. So what you will see here is a forward simulation. You have a subsurface reservoir down the model that's not shown and there are light fluids that want to migrate upwards. And instead of kind of migrating in a diffuse way where you would just kind of spread the entire domain, there is a kind of global a collective motion that would tend to locally deform the the rock, which, which is not shown here, the color bar is the permeability, kind of the transmissivity of the fluid, and it's going forward in time. And then there are slices of the zoomed in region. So how it goes, and like where it's red, it means that you have a more fluid concentration, and you see that produces uh, in a given range with a given extent, some fingers, and like permeability or kind of porosity gets enhanced over like uh, this is a log scale, so like kind of form order of magnitude range. And this is those kind of simulation that we try to run on supercomputers. So now quickly, um, the movie making off. So this, sim this particular simulation was done on a, involving 2 billion grid points in 3D. So it was, had a spatial resolution on a staggered finite, uh, on a staggered grid using finite differences of 1,000, 1,000, and 2,000 grid points. Uh, like there were um, kind of, it was a Navier-Stokes plus nonlinear diffusion. So overall, like there were more than I think 16 or 17 fields that had like each, each cell had 16 or 17 variables that one has to kind of uh, compute at each time step. And like it, we need a quite high uh, time, time resolution. So there were like uh, 20,000 implicit time steps that were performed to, to get the evolution of the of the system. Um, the code I show you here was like it's a, a MPIC CUDA code like that we developed uh, in order to target performance. We kind of kept it to the maximum, to the minimum. And so the code is pretty short, but we tried to keep it run like efficiently. 
I think this run took um, about three weeks on a, like, on a mid-sized supercomputer. So yeah, there's some performance issue that uh, come quickly up. And uh, yeah, like some uses quite some memory. We try to keep the memory usage low. These codes are memory bounded. So the more memory you use, the more data you send around, the slower everything will go. So that's a bit the uh, rules of the game. So if people are interested, this is summarized in a paper we published recently. Now, maybe a few words about the numerical method we used. So since those, um, this, like this application runs on large uh, distributed memory machines, which means that uh, kind of matrix-based solver and direct methods get to their limitation. So basically, we use there an iterative solver. But somehow, some of the iterative solver also reach their limit. For example, if you go with heavy multigrid solvers and things like that, you may run into troubles if you get very much nonlinearities, uh, convergence, you get convergence issues, and also uh, like the more complexity your solver has to handle, the more data will be sent around and the slower everything will go. So we decided to use um, kind of old technique that works pretty well. So it's kind of basic iteration that gets a slight enhancement to, in order to still scale well. So basically we want uh, to minimize a residual or solve f a equals zero, one can make trivial iterations saying that, well, I introduce a numerical time derivative and try to solve it. While this will not converge very well, and it will take like the, uh, it will scale more or less order n square, which is bad. So what we do, we use a kind of second order iteration, which means adding some uh, higher order uh, numerical transient terms. And this trick will add somehow, uh, so this will converge over iteration towards zero, and it's like kind of adding somehow damping, and like this will enhance convergence rates. And by adding only one field, like one has just to, to keep in memory the previous kind of uh, rate of change. So it's kind of very light memory addition, but with massive convergence uh, enhancement. The, the main goals of this is that uh, the entire procedure in, in involves no global reduction. So there is, everything is local. Um, there's only local communication going on. And this kind of approach is really what we want to target for uh, going to a uh, high, high resolution because then you're totally, you're, you increase like the, you have a high data locality, which means like, well, um, you don't, you, you will not be killed by global communication. So this is also kind of summarized recently if you want to see more about it. Uh, main results is that kind of our solver like 3DHM uh, is pretty close to ideal uh, order uh, n or n log n algorithm. I think we are order n 1.3, which is not bad for just having added one uh, field to a very uh, simple uh, iterative algorithm. And maybe the other cool thing is like when we run it on the full Pittstein, so the um, it's a Cray XA50 at the Swiss National Supercomputer Center. Uh, it's, I think it's, or it used to be the third biggest supercomputer in the world. Uh, we get um, around 93% of parallel efficiency with the baseline being at 95%, which means we have uh, only lose 2% of parallel efficiency from going from one GPU to 5,120 um, GPUs. So those are the thing we're uh, playing with and um, yeah, there is still one kind of limit in all this f um, framework that we're kind of working with is that um, we're facing that kind of problem that, well, in order to develop the algorithm, uh, think about like what, like conf what configuration to run on, uh, what kind of solving strategy, uh, some other issues like this, we basically like to prototype it in a language where kind of easy to write, easy to work with, easy to visualize, easy to work in the train with or whatever on the road. Uh, but then somehow you cannot uh, for sure run it on 5,000 GPUs and you will wait forever to get somehow uh, good results in 3D. Um, the other thing would be, well, do everything in a kind of low level language like C or Fortran, like it's done usually where, well, it will run fast, but it's somehow painful to go through the development step and back and forth and try new ideas and this gets very lengthy. So um, by kind of 
if, if one tries to do the prototyping on a high level language and then the actual production code on a low level language, we basically introduce a barrier, a barrier between two languages. And um, yeah, so this somehow barrier here is kind of summarized what, so in the prototype, it's kind of simple and high level. It will be at the end slow and the production code, there will kind of be complex and low level, but on the other hand, they will, they will run fast. Um, the thing is that somehow one really would need both. So uh, what can we do? Well, one thing I was working with my collaborators and we also did somehow provide some, some, some uh, answer to this was, well, we could translate, make the prototype, for example, in MATLAB and Python, and then make an automatic or semi-automatic translator that would translate it to a production code, by run the production code, and that would be more or less fine, but usually this is an iterative process, so you, you start a project, you don't know, uh, maybe all the, one has to tweak, change a bit equation, one has to some change a bit input configuration, and so on and so on, so it starts to, well, if I want to continue to develop, uh, I somehow have to go back to my prototype, which is maybe then, it starts to get costly if you want to have this loop, and uh, like, it, at the end it boils down to a lot of maintenance, and somehow, it becomes co costly. So that's basically where we recently s thought, well, it looks like there is something that claims doing both, that doing both prototype and production code that should be simple and high level, interactive, that would generate kind of low development cost, but still be fast, the thing, the key feature we want from the low level language. Um, yeah, so that's basically what Julia claims, to be fast and interactive, uh, and it's kind of fast because it's, it's shortly compiled before using it, and so we gave it a try, and this is what I will now focus on for the rest of the talk. So on that Julia project, I collaborated with uh, Samuel Omlin, who was a former PhD colleague that worked with me in Lausanne together with Yuri Podlachikov, and he's now a computational scientist at Swiss National Supercomputing Center. And uh, yeah, so we did kind of this development uh, together. So now we'll explain you a few steps, or the few more, most important step, how we managed basically to port the 3D hydromechanical application I was showing you uh, in the beginning to Julia, and to Julia GPU, to Julia MPI GPU, and uh, what performance we got with kind of some basic usage of this Julia MPI GPU. And if like we will or not continue go that path. Um, so the kind of our challenge we're facing is this, like we wanted to replace our current workflow, which was prototyping in MATLAB, porting uh, man-made or semi-automatic to CUDA CMPI and going back and forth, like trying to fix all what needs to be fixed. And now we want to see if we can grab this and make it all a jewel like So how our, what, how our code looks like in very essence, so we have some definition of physical and numerical parameters, then initialization steps of all the fields we need, and then we have a time loop. In the time loop, we make nonlinear iteration to solve uh, implicit time steps. Uh, check convergence, and at the end we want to make some post-processing and visualization. And this structure is true both for a prototype in MATLAB and for the um, kind of um, um, production code. Now, what, how we thought making it is, well, let's try to take all what's possible from the MATLAB prototype and kind of directly translate it to Julia, except for the compute intensive part, which should be which is the kind of the kernels or a function that will be called the most in the algorithm is in, within the nonlinear iteration when you evaluate your stencil. And this we want to actually use the fact that one can kind of natively use it as well in Julia through some packages, kind of directly put in the working um, C code, CUDA code or whatever is parallel and should work very fast. So this is how uh, our development steps would look like. And now I will kind of take some step like time to, that we fill in together basically some example of this, of this code. So for example, we'll kind of initialize some physical parameters like define the um, grid spacing and then uh, initialize the fields. For example, here in the, to initialize the fields, 
I will use uh, some CUDA uh, packages and kind of use the CUDA1 uh, um, uh, features, which would initialize a array to run on, uh, on the GPU. Uh, then afterwards, I can define my time, time loop around my nonlinear iterations. And uh, here comes the kind of performance critical part where I want to, whatever, compute my, evaluate my stencil, and there how I do it, well, I call um, with the uh, at CUDA macro, I call that function, I write a GPU-like function inside, and this would be launched as a kernel on the, on the GPU. How the CUDA kernel look like, for example, this is a simple 1D heat diffusion kernel where uh, I have basically a standard function, here it's 1D, so I update my temperature based on previous temperature and times uh, diffusion coefficient lambda and then evaluate like low order derivatives. And so the, what CUDA gives is this block, IDing, block index, block dimension thread index. This is just a vectorized kind of CUDA thing that will, instead of making a loop, it will access like every thread has its own index and so it's so, uh, like this that it works in parallel. Uh, if you want a normal CPU version, basically you kick out that trend index and replace it by a simple loop. And that would work as well. So this done, afterwards we can kind of uh, check out convergence, like easy trick, not do it every iteration, every 10, 100, 1,000 iteration if you make a lot of iteration, and that's it, you kind of hide uh, the latency of that thing so it doesn't show up in your performance, and then kind of some post-processing and visualization at the end uh, using whatever um, uh, package that's available in Julia and that works kind of interactively. Now the kind of other important step is like how we uh, manage to uh, use distributed memory machines, so basically using MPI. So um, mainly Sam uh, created a, a Cartesian staggered grid module for Julia, which, which is called GG for implicit global grid. And this um, module uses basically MPI. So uh, how we use MPI, we have our global grid that's composed of uh, local processes and the idea is that each MPI process which is colored in different color will handle one different GPU and it's like how we can split our global domain in subdomains and send in each subdomain computing it on a, on a different GPU and uh, we have um, it's kind of a memory decomposition, uh, domain decomposition. So basically the only thing we have to do afterwards is somehow care about internal boundary condition, which will be sent by MPI. And so the local process, they kind of have boundary condition and they don't really care if they get boundary condition from MPI or from the global physical boundary condition. And like this is how, and it's somehow local because you will, all, I mean, the worst case in 3D, you have to communicate to your nine neighbors and that's it. So you, kind of keep the, thing, um, keep the thing local. And so, uh, yeah, for example, if I zoom in that yellow process uh, on one GPU, basically, I will have to just care about my local neighbor. And um, yeah, so the, the global grid size will be implicitly given by the local size and the number of MPI processes here, two by two. So the uh, GG module basically has only three buttons or three things that you can use. It's one has to initialize the global grid, then one has to update the halo of whatever array you have to send with MPI, and then you have to finalize the uh, MPI call. Um, and for sure, how does the, like the local process, they don't know that they're part of a bigger calculation. The only thing that should know about it is your initialization, like when you initialize your, uh, you have your initial condition, this should be somehow spread over the processes with global coordinates. And um, with CUDA, there's an easy way uh, using streams, asynchronous uh, execution to basically, in such kind of uh, domain decomposition, to basically hide mes message, uh, hide the latency or the time you spend sending around uh, messages for updating boundaries by computation in a very uh, native way. And this uh, works pretty well for uh, our application. And yes, the GG module is kind of nothing related ex only for that application. It's, it would be kind of working for every uh, whatever staggered grid application. 
So with this said, uh, we can augment our uh, short code with, well, now I compute my phi would be my porosity that I plotted, and then uh, I, um, I have to kind of, each time I compute it, since my internal boundary conditions are not correct, since I should exchange them with my neighboring process, I can update Halo and call like whatever fields I need to update there, and at the end, kind of finalize my uh, MPI call. So another, um, another useful thing, while maybe more for the develop at the development stage is, well, what if uh, I don't want for, maybe I don't want directly to use a GPU, but I kind of would be, it would be nice that my um, prototype can use, I don't know, the four cores or eight cores that I have on my laptop or whatever on my um, Xeon processor or whatever, like 12 cores I have available. Uh, this would be kind of, again, something that would help decrease uh, maintenance costs. Uh, there, is a, there is a simple way kind of combining make macros where one can uh, make a single code for single thread CPU to multi CPU or multi GPU, just kind of uh, defining, uh, we define a global flag, use GPU. If that's then we define the way macros to run to initialize GPU arrays or else it would just target CPU arrays. And then, um, yeah, one can within the kernel one can uh, make the um, like kernel launch with CUDA, passing the uh, CUDA arguments like blocks and threads, or otherwise it would just kind of call the function without specifying anything related to CUDA. And then we can replace now here this macro instead of CUDA, we can call the kernel macro, and this would then take care if we run on a GPU or not. Uh, the um, other thing is within the... Uh, Within the kernel, we have to take care if we use GPU, we have to define these vectorized CUDA indices. If we use a CPU version, uh, we kind of have to implement this double or like as many loop as we have spatial dimension, basically. And uh, since uh, recently there is this uh, multi-threading available in Julia, so for a CPU version, actually, if one want to use, if one uh, want to activate multi-threading, one can basically um, yeah, one should export the, the number of available threads, and then if I replace at threads here, for example, for the outer loop, it would make the um, kind of shared memory parallelization within the uh, within the loop version. Um, then finally, uh, in the in I have to replace this now threads ID or loop macro within the a compute intensive function, like either the GPU kernel or the C um, kind of C uh, function, does maybe multi-threader or not, and this would look like this with the with the red line. So basically, using this uh, kind of simple syntax and macro within Julia, there's an easy way uh, we define here just having this use GPU flag. Either it's true or false. This would allow to run on multiple GPU or on, or on multiple CPUs. And then for the CPUs, one can easily export the threads one wants to have a multi-threaded uh, CPU application. And then to use MPI, basically, one just has to launch that code uh, with minus n how many MPI processes you, you want to use. So the, that's what we did with our like with the uh, uh, C and MPI uh, code, starting from our mixing our prototype and production code, and uh, it works. So this is our visualization uh, where we, while it's running, we gather data every few iteration, a uh, few time steps on MPI rank zero and visualize it, and we get a, like a low resolution. This is now was now um, tested on 127. Uh, plus cubes, like 127, 127, 250 cubes, and we get kind of from a not random perturbation a very uh, nice distribution of this high uh, permeability channel that propagates. Uh, regarding uh, performance issues, so the single GPU performance Julia code versus the C CUDA code runs at 93%, so pretty close to the same performance, and then if we use the MPI, uh, to scale it out on multi-GPU, we see that basically um, 
So the, uh, the parallel efficiency is on the y-axis, the number of GP on the x-axis. The JULA code is uh, the orange line on the top, so we start at a parallel efficiency close to 1, and we lose only 3% of parallel efficiency while we're going from 1 to 1,024 GPUs. And since it's flattened out, one can more or less extrapolate that if one would run it on 5,000 GPU, I think the performance would stay more or less between nine, around 95%. Uh, the, it's very nice and same behavior than the uh, plain um, C CUDA MPI code where the baseline was a bit lower because we didn't have time to rerun the experiment, but basically we only lose as well 2-3% of parallel efficiency. If we zoom in in that red region, basically we see that uh, yeah, both have very similar behavior and that the, actually uh, the 3D Julia MPI uh, CUDA code performs pretty much as, as good as the uh, like plain C CUDA MPI code. So with it, I kind of hope I gave you a nice short overview of uh, possibilities of like high performance computing uh, using Julia. Uh, the kind of take home messages would be that 90% of the codes come from the prototype that's all high, uh, nice and high level at only the compute intensive kernel were taken from the uh, like CUDA uh, C, CUDA, or low-level uh, code. Um, dan uh, yeah, thanks to this GG module, we only need kind of three buttons to add uh, the fully uh, high-performance capabilities on, on, the, on the test code, and this would allow to run from single thread CPU towards like uh, massively multi-GPU code. Uh, e in situ visualization, we're still working on, but it's kind of somehow simple once, if one at least reduces on a master thread. And yeah, the performance is what was the main issue we're pretty, pretty happy with because uh, like we are, uh, the Joula port is around, we lose 7% performance roughly versus an optimized uh, CUDA, C, uh, MPI, uh, CUDA C code. And yeah, the, we get more or less 95% 90, of parallel efficiency up to 1,000 uh, for 1,024 GPUs for, for now on. Uh, so, and on top of that, we solved our two language problem. So the, um, yeah, so they're nearly ideal efficiency up to like many, many GPUs. And I want to take the last uh, few words to uh, thank the developer of the CUDA RAISE, CUDA native, CUDA driver, and MPI Julia packages because they, like, those really enable us to, to, to perform those, those uh, very nice uh, and performance-related uh, um, application. And if uh, you have somehow interest in the gg.julia.gl module, just contact I think Sam, he would be more than happy to like give further explanation or even release it publicly if there is interest. And uh, yeah, some references. And with this, I thank you for your attention. Thanks, another question. Any question? And I'm open to questions. <laughs> Okay, so next thanks Nola again. And uh, the next one.